I heard the story from an old friend of mine, George P.S. Peterson, the Papa Stewart, lovely old guy. And uh, he told the story, this is a Papa Stewart story. Now, there was a man who had a boat, and it was winter time, and it was frosty night, and he was going to check on his sheep one day, and you know, he noticed that there was something wrong about his boat. It didn't look the same as he'd left it. So he went in and checked, and it wasn't tied in the same way that he had always tied it. And he thought, that's funny, something going on here. But, you know, he thought, oh, well, and off he went. Well, a bit later, a few days later, he could see that the boat, again, wasn't the same. He would keep retying it the way that he always secured it. But there was, it was always, when he came back, there was always different knots in it. It was slightly different. And he thought, somebody's been using my boat. So he decided to do the same thing. He hid on the boat as well weigh a piece of old canvas sail over the top of it. And he waited until night time and it was pitch dark, but the moon was rising and it was a big full moon. So it was cast in light everywhere. And then he could hear the sound of boots on the gravel and somebody untying the rope. And he could feel the boat being pushed down. And as he looked out further the cloth, he could see four pairs of small hands coming out of the gunnel of the boats and into the boat sprang four trows. And he thought, aye aye, uh, you know, trouble now. So he just waited and there was one of them was at the, at the, on the uh, teller. There was another one that had two oars and there was another couple that had one oar each. And George P.S. Peterson said, it's a wonderful word, we, we don't have it in Orkney, it's a piag. He did it four piags, which is four strokes of the oar. Pulling on the oar four times, they did four piags. And he could hear the boat hitting a gravel beach. And he thought, that's weird. Because there's no shore, there's no beach near about hands that you know, four strokes of the oar would take it to you. So he headed anyway, they pulled the boat up the beach, they jumped over the side and they all headed off. Well, he got up and had a look around and in the moonlight he could see where they were and he recognized the place. They were on a beach and there was a cliff up in front of them. But the thing is, it was nowhere near where he lived. It would have taken four men many hours to row to that place and yet they'd done it with four piags on the oar and so he looked up and they were all heading up a path towards a cliff and in the cliff there was a cave and he didn't ever remember there being a cave there before he'd been there you know in the past collecting driftwood that had been washed ashore off a deck cargo or ship he knew that place well He'd never seen a cave in the side of the cliff before. But they all went in there and they all came back and they were all carrying a keg on their shoulders. And they set the keg in the boat and then the one of them headed back up to the cave and he came back with another keg on the shoulder and he set it in the boat. And they got into the oars and another four piags and they were back where they started. Pulled the boat up to the nose, they secured it and they carried out the kegs with the boat and they were all saying one for me, one for me, one for me, one for me and then they placed one right in front of where he was hiding and says one for the owner, one for the owner, one for the owner <laughs> and they jumped out the boat and left so because he knew that they, they'd known all along that he was hiding there but when they'd gone and he'd gone and retied the boat the way that he liked to tie it he picked up this keg and it was heavy so he staggers up the beach with this keg and anyway, he takes it to his house, sets it down, opens it, and it was full of the most fantastic brandy that he'd ever tasted in his life. If he'd ever had much brandy, you know, because it wasn't what poor people could afford, but this was wonderful brandy. And soon, well, he was, his house was the place to be, you know, for Yule that year, everybody was coming to visit him. 
and get a dram of this wonderful brandy. And they kept saying, why did he get this wonderful drink for you? He was kind of evasive and no one to see. And then eventually he kind of admitted and he said, oh, well, you see, there was somebody who used to be bought my head in and it was trows. And they just bought piags and they were on the shore there and they get up the cave and they took this and they gave one to me. Now a lot of these young guys were sitting there listening to this and they knew, of course, where this place was and they thought, hmm, brandy, you say, in a cave, you say, hmm, ponder, ponder. So they decided to set off and they rode to this place as well, one frosty night when it was flat calm. And of course it took them a lot more than 40 eggs to get there. They were rowing for hours and hours and they were absolutely knackered by the time that they got there. And they staggered up the beach and they searched all over the cliff, but there was no one chink in the rock. There was no cave, there was nothing there. So they then all they got as the reward was another very long, very hard row all the way back. But Unfortunately, in a lot of these stories, the folks say when the keg was empty, it never emptied, it always filled up again, but sadly no in this case. The brandy was drunk, it was enjoyed, and that was the end of it. And the, uh, the fella always hoped that the trous would burrow his boat again, maybe leave him another keg, but they never did. So you can't, you can't trust trials, basically. <laughs> anyway, thank you.